Okay, can we all rise for the pledge? Thank you, uh, Mr. Desai. Raise your right hand, please. Repeat after me. I state your name. Do solemnly swear. I do not decide. Solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. Obey and defend. Obey and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And Constitution of this Commonwealth. And the Constitution of this Commonwealth. And that I will. Since I'm having a hard time you. hearing. And I will discharge the duties. And I'll discharge the duties. Of my office with fidelity. Of my office with fidelity. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, would you join us at the table? Roll call, please. Mrs. Fryrick? Here. Mr. Desai? Here. Mr. Posnow? Here. Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Sanders? Here. Mrs. Trader? Here. Mr. Sears? Here. Mr. Sullivan? Here. Mr. Toman? Here. Nine members present. Thank you. Uh, reminder to please silence your cell phones during the meeting. And this is the first opportunity for public comment. All comments and questions will be addressed to the president. Board and staff members will not normally respond to comments or questions during the meeting unless recognized by the president for this purpose. Comments will be limited at the discretion of the president to five minutes or less. Good evening. Uh, Jamie Evans, Spring Berry Township. Uh, I think most of you know I'm, a, I'm an alumni of York Suburban, a taxpayer, a teacher, and I'm also the president of the Education Association and the Education Support Professionals. Tonight's agenda includes a restructuring of the Director of Elementary Education to the Director of Curriculum and Instruction. While the realignment of administrative positions may be needed, the filling of rather than the elimination of an administrative position appears unnecessary at this time given the current state of the York Suburban School District. Let me be clear, this is in opposition to the position and not the recommended candidate. Over the last several years, many teaching positions have been eliminated via attrition through retirement. At a minimum, and as I was writing this just off the top of my head, three, three physical education teachers, an elementary teacher, a middle school social studies teacher, a high school social studies teacher, a middle school science teacher, and at the height of COVID restrictions and contact tracing, a certified school nurse was reduced to a health room assistant, which is currently unfilled. These reductions have created a ripple effect felt throughout the district and the students and teachers suffer the consequences. The cuts to the physical education department have negatively impacted the entire related art, arts program at the elementary and middle school, result, resulting in increased class sizes that exceed board guidelines. The middle school eliminations forced reassignments throughout the middle and elementary schools, which resulted in fewer elementary positions throughout the district. Thankfully, at the 11th hour, kindergarten positions were added at both primary, primary buildings to keep classes within the maximum board guidelines. Even with the additions of those two kindergarten positions, Yorkshire is currently at the maximum amount and one is over. And of the 15 to 20 student guideline, while Valley View is very close behind to exceeding. A few new students at each building will push kindergarten over those recommended guidelines. 
The elimination of the Indian Rock position has resulted in class sizes well above the board guidelines of 20 to 25, including our autistic support students. Fourth grade currently has 27, 29, 29, and 29 on their rosters. These are two examples, but reality is that our entire elementary program is at or beyond the board classroom guidelines. This is unacceptable. Moreover, at the high school, they had to cancel the AP U.S. History class because the social studies position was not replaced. Student enrollment in the course and the performance on the AP exam were both on the rise. And YS may now be the only York County school not to offer that AP course. Again, unacceptable. The board policy states that, quote, when financially and administratively appropriate and space is available, class size should not exceed the guidelines, unquote. On behalf of YSEA, I am not convinced that we as a district are following this policy and doing what is in the best interest of our students. Instead, the district should seriously reconsider how it is filling or realigning administrative positions and revisit the teaching positions that have remained unfilled or eliminated over the last few years and should and be sure we are set, setting our students up for success in a classroom where the, the teacher is not stretched so thin in trying to provide the quality education we are known to provide. I ask that you reconsider how these funds are spent and reconsider the creation of the lost teaching positions, especially at a time when our students are experiencing such a multitude of challenges we've never seen before. As our York suburban educators continue to work without a contract and as negotiations drag on, we are reminded of the district's obligation to be fiscally responsible. In the spirit of being fiscally responsible, if the district continues to hold a strong belief that it continues to be necessary to eliminate teaching positions, then the same should apply to administrative positions. It is my hope that you vote no on committee report item A1B, the creation of the Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Thank you for your tireless service to York Suburban. Okay, we have the uh we have the approval of the minutes of the regular monthly meeting that was conducted on August 22nd. Before we approve them, are there any corrections? Yes, Mr. President, I would like to make an amendment to item number four under the business office report. There was a clerical error that represented the uh, in faithful transportation contract. The motion itself had a daily rate of 192. However, the contract that was linked the daily rate was 209. That was a clerical error on my part. Which was correct? The 209. Okay, thank you. With that change in mind, can we accept this as presented? Okay. And we also have the minutes here from the special meeting that was conducted on August 29th. And unless there are changes, corrections, they can be approved as submitted, I think. And then Dr. Krauser, I have no report. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I want to extend a, a huge expression of thanks to the community and their involvement in homecoming. I know Ms. Long will speak more about that uh, this evening, but uh, we did have a great uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday weekend of homecoming events, um, so I know you'll hear more about that shortly this evening. Um, number two this evening is um, I want to... Um, Share a little bit from Dr. Lorfink regarding our comprehensive plan update. Um, we've been busy with that since the start, actually before Dr. Lorfink began, um, with, with an update to that process. Uh, and number three, I'd like to, uh, again, uh, draw attention to the recommendation from administration regarding the director of curriculum instruction position um, has shared with the staff, the staff this past week, um, the position of curriculum instruction is a critical component. Um, the guaranteeing viable curriculum that's essential for our student achievement is critical to the work that we do within the organization. Uh, we've had a very focused effort through our early comprehensive plan work regarding our needs assessment uh, through our math audit as well as our assessment with our current curriculum and a dedicated and focused attention to increasing our student achievement. Um, and to do that is the assurances of that with a guaranteed and viable curriculum. Uh, and that's why the administration is recommending the position of a director of curriculum instruction. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Lorfink to talk about the comprehensive plan. Oh, thank you, Dr. Kreiser. 
All right, so wanted to share a little update for the board this evening and the community on where we are as far as our comprehensive planning. Uh, first thing I want to do is to recognize our team. We have a wide variety of stakeholders from across the York suburban community, staff, students, parents, uh, as well as board members represented uh, on our committee. So I just wanted to take a minute and thank you all for all of your hard work. Um, there is a lot of thought that goes into the comprehensive planning process, as well as some time on the members' behalf. Just wanted to remind everyone a little bit about how comprehensive planning does work, and strategic planning is what it used to be called. They've changed some of that language here in Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania Department of Education has moved to a every three-year comprehensive planning process. They've shortened the duration of the comprehensive planning process. Uh, as we all know that things move a lot faster now than they seem like they used to. So uh, we look at an every three-year cycle. We're in the last year currently of our current comprehensive plan. Uh, and as you can imagine, some of the, the goals that were, that were set three years ago, four years ago, um, because of COVID and the pandemic, really got put on hold as we went into emergency crisis mode and um, across the state and the country and, and frankly, the globe. So we're looking at, uh, as far as comprehensive planning goes, we're looking at continuous improvement in the areas of leadership, teaching, and student learning. We're establishing common beliefs. So this is something we've been working on across um, the summer. And we're using those common beliefs to set some priorities at the organizational level, looking at a big picture view. These are big goals that we're looking at. And these goals will help us uh, at the board of director level set some common outcomes. And we'll be using the employees, parents, and students for our guideposts along the way. And we're using organizational frameworks on future activities and initiatives. So we're looking at what are those beliefs, what is really critical and important to us, and what is the data showing that we really need to be doing to prepare our students for the future. Just wanted to remind everyone of our current mission and vision statements. Uh, these are not going to change with the comprehensive planning process. So that is something that often districts will do is, is during the comprehensive planning progress process, look at the vision statement, look at the mission statement vision statement. Uh, but that vision statement especially is a, a vision for the future, and we're not there yet. Uh, so we are continuing to work on all of these items in our vision statement. Moving along with that, our district broad goals are not changing as well. We are still focusing on these four big picture goals of student success, district well-being, high quality teaching and learning, and operational responsibility and partnerships. So as we're looking at updating and revising goals, these goalposts will not be changing. So what is changing? So one of the things that we're doing, the state has um, released a different planning tool. So you can imagine anytime the state releases a new tool, things change a little bit. So these are, we start with our vision, our mission, and our broad goals, which were already established. And now we're looking at our educational values. Uh, the state has asked us to take a different look, different perspective at value planning and what our beliefs are as a district, and to really look at what are the beliefs and the values of our students, different from our teachers different from our community, different from our business partners. So we're really taking those values and just kind of sorting them and really looking at what they look like in different areas and with different stakeholders. Where we are right now at the comprehensive planning process is we're looking at those goals. So we've got the big picture goals. So now where are we as a district and where do we want to be? And we're going to be looking at a comprehensive needs assessment to figure out exactly where we are, what's working, and what's not, and then how we're going to adjust for the future. So what are we doing now? So we've had two full, well, we've had one full committee meeting, uh, as Dr. Krauser said before I got here on July 13th. I, I had the pleasure of meeting the committee for the first time and working a little bit on this process. And we're having another full committee meeting on September 28th. So invitations have gone out to the committee with some pre-work for them to just look at to prepare for that meeting. We're going to be continuing that needs assessment. So since I've been on board and even before I was here, everyone at the administrative team, teachers have been involved as well on really collecting that information and that data to show where are we and what's working and what's not. So the committee on September 28th will be continuing with that needs assessment. Um, we want to really look at some data and, and where this district is from different lenses. So we want the students to look at the test data and say, what's working, what's not. We want the teachers to look at that, parents community members. So they're going to be doing that on September 28th. We'll take that needs assessment, continue to outline goals. I can tell you a couple goals that will definitely be in there. We need to work on, um, as Dr. Krauser mentioned, the math audit that was completed last year, really articulating 
the, the values and or the um, the information that was in that math audit, and really looking at what are we going to do about mathematics education to make sure that our students um, are successful in the area of mathematics. We're going to be working on the next generation science standards that were just adopted by the state and making sure that those are implemented. So those are two big pictures. Continuing to focus on social emotional learning, what and student well being, staff well being. What do we need to be doing in those areas? Continuing our look at the science of reading and what that means for our students in reading and writing, K to 12. Um, and we'll also be looking at that operational responsibility and partnerships, making sure that we are continued to stay fiscally sound uh, and responsible for our taxpayers. At this point, we also have a professional development subcommittee. We sent a survey out to all staff. We had over 200 plus responses from staff as to what they would like in the areas of professional development. There's going to be a subcommittee that's going to meet at least twice a year moving forward for the next few years. And we'll also be focusing on our teacher induction. How do we bring our new teachers and staff in and make sure that they have what they need to continue meeting the needs of our students. And then some upcoming dates for you as a board to be aware of. We're hoping to have the draft comprehensive plan to you on October 24th. I will be back again to do a more comprehensive overview of just what is in that plan give you a chance to ask us any questions. And then there'll be a 30-day public review period with a planned vote on the on the entire plan on November 28th. Are there any questions? Uh, I've got one, Dr. Law. Um, in doing this, you talked about, you know, part of the, the, the high, is mission is a high-quality teaching goal, teaching, and also student success. How do you envision and applying SMART goals to individual teacher performance in the classroom to actually map back to that student progress? Well, and we're already doing some of that as a district. I was pleased to see that part of our um, professional learning goals for our teachers is that they set individualized prof professional goals for themselves um, that are supposed to be written as SMART goals. I think that's something we're going to be revisiting and making sure that that's being done correctly and, and appropriately to make sure it matches back to those goals as a district. Um, and the other thing is that sometime in the next year, one of the other buckets of, uh, of activities that I have to do is to look through our Act 13 professional development, I'm sorry, um, professional education plan for our teachers. So uh, the state passed a updated framework for teacher professional development and professional learning, um, as well as observation, evaluation, and supervision. And we need to really take a look at that. So that's something that I want to look at as well. So, so how will that map to specific student performance? Will one of the SMART goals be, I will learn, I will improve GPA by some percent? Yeah, I think it's going to depend on, it has to be individualized to each teacher's role in the classroom as well, right? So um, math is a good example. So we, are need, we definitely need to look at mathematics education uh, and see where our students are succeeding and not in mathematics as a district. Uh, and so, for example, a math goal, the, the teachers need to be really looking at mathematics as a whole um, if they teach that subject. But that goal is not going to apply to our physical education teachers. So we want to make sure that every teacher has a specific goal that goes back to student learning but that needs to be centered around their role in the district. Thank you. Dr. Lohr, I think I have a couple questions. Sure. So if I understand the timeline correctly, we're getting our first eyes on this. October 24th, right? Yes, that's correct. And 30 days for the public, and then we're voting November in November on it. Yes. Seems like a tight timeline. Is that normal for these types of plans? Um, yeah, in general it is. I, that's why there is such a large committee looking at the information so that by the time that it comes to the board, uh, it's pretty well laid out. Um, and we can continue to update you along the way as well. I only ask because I know when we do policy updates, we have two meetings to look at it, plus a policy committee to assess it. And we're getting 30 days on something that, to me, is a much bigger document than any policy update that we get. So we're getting probably two to two and a half months on policy changes, but we're getting 30 days on this. So I'm suggesting that we extend the timeline to vote on this because there's going to be a lot of information that we're going to need to digest on this. The, the timeline is, is mandated by the state. Um, so one of the items that we can do is we can parse it out ahead of time and provide some advancement. But the, the, the document itself has to be on 30-day public review for before the end of November timeline vote. So we can, um, I believe that Dr. Lorfink and I can look at this sitting document as it sits now 
uh, with the upcoming committee meeting and see what we can parse out from some of the steps. There are a lot of assurances and things that in that comprehensive document or a review of the prior, as mentioned, the vision, mission, some of those kind of early pages of the document are very similar. But the actual goal development, we can probably try to get some of that earlier in advance. I think that would be helpful, mm -hmm. at least for me. I can't speak for the other members of the board, but you know, again, given how much time we're given to review policies, this is kind of more important than, than policies in my mind. But I'll leave that up to us. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Borfink. Um, and again, just to kind of echo that, um, the work is comprehensive from a committee as it moves through that process. Um, as Dr. Warfink mentioned, uh, we've had a great opportunity to solicit the feedback and information from the committees, and certainly COVID has taught us a lot that we know more, we know better, and how are we applying that to these next steps of the process. So that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, what is the status of the free lunches programs? I know the governor has made some proposals and things are wandering around in the state legislature. Where do we stand on that in reality? So at the moment, the governor did um, have a mandate for free breakfast, which we are already doing. So it's mm -hmm. just a matter of us getting information from the state on how that would change our application process um, since we're already offering free breakfast. There's no change to lunch. So lunch okay. is still remaining the same. Okay. And, and that, that would be an October timeline for that. And how, how are we doing then uh, with um, reminding our families to fill out the free and reduced lunch forms for the, so that they continue to get, am I correct, the, the lunch mm -hmm. program? I glad we're going to get money from the state for the that's, breakfast. That's going to save us the money in our food service account then that we were going to spend. Am I correct? That's correct. So... We were using reserve because last year we had a surplus because we were free. Um, and so now we no longer have to use that reserve. We'll have to come up with a different uh, plan to use to draw down that reserve. Um, as far as the communication to parents, that's a great question. Dr. Krauser and I talked about that this week, actually, uh, today, um, about issuing a, just a reminder to our parents about us serving free breakfast. However, uh, a meal application still needs to be complete in order to qualify for free or reduced lunch. Okay, thank you. And I'll, and I'll add to that, at building level interactions, um, those things are still occurring. Information shared at back to school nights, uh, guidance conference meetings, those kinds of things are still happening at the building level as well. I know it's an arduous task and, and to catch up with all of these families, but it's extremely important for the students, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy, remind me again, can you, can you for, for the public's interest, can you explain when we put money in our food fund? Absolutely. What, what we can and can't do with that food fund and, and the, the brilliance of what we're doing with this free breakfast here? Yes. So um, the, law, the, the law limits uh, how much reserve we have in the food service fund. Um, and that uh, limitation is to three months of average expenditures. Um, so it's not much. Um, however, any projects um, or plans that we have to draw down the reserve are only dedicated to the food service. So it's just restricted to food service department um, and anything related to the meals or the operations. So correct me if I'm wrong, we can go get Wolf Appliances and put the best and the brightest in our cafeteria, but we can't use those funds to support our staff, correct? That. As an example. That's correct because it has to be food related. It has to be food service related. So we couldn't use it for general fund operations. Okay, so this gift we're getting from the governor is really not a gift, it's more of a burden on the, on the district. That's my statement, not a question to you. Thank you. Uh, it's Joel. Does that actually make our situation worse as it relates to the uh, the three months of surplus? It does in the sense that we um, we had a plan and now we no longer have that plan. And so we just have to come up with a different plan. So in other words, a different way to spend more money. A different way to spend down our reserve. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Chichuli, you're up. 
Under the business office uh, report, there are uh, four items for vote, and the other remaining items are for discussion and consideration at the September 19th meeting. The first item is um, a service contract with Debt Book, uh, GASB 87, which GASB stands for Governmental Accounting Standards Board, issued um, a new standard that requires us to record long-term leases on our financial statements. Uh, Debt Book is a web, web based application that guides us through that implementation and assists with accounting functions such as depreciation and the journal entry and as and the financial note for the statements. The cost of the application is $3,000 for one year. The term of the contract is for one year. Looking ahead, we're also looking to use this uh, program to assist with implementation of the GASB 96, which takes into effect next year. Uh, they have a, a, pro, a part of the program also addresses that gas fee. And so we are asking for approval for this service contract. Do I have a motion? Okay. Thank you. Questions, comments? I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Item B and C are uh, items that go together. Um, if you recall, um, we discussed at a property and finance committee about the Indian Rock walk-in freezer cooler, um, and that was discussed at our August 15th property and finance committee. So we are looking for approval for uh, the electrical work um, in the amount of $3,356. And the installation, the equipment and the installation of the walk-in cooler and freezer for $11,700. So do I have a motion on B and C combined? So moved. Second. Thank you. Questions, comments? I think this can be unanimous roll call vote as well. This will be considered a unanimous. Oh, hello, it's Joel. Hi, Mr. Sanders. I have a question. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. When we uh, met on August 15th, the number that was used to approximate the cost of the freezer and the cooler was 26000 So is this total of what, 14000 covering that, that same expenditure? Yes. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Thompson to come up and just give provide an explanation. Thank you. So there is actually a second quote that is list that should be listed on there, and that's going to be my error to Mrs. Chichuli. Um, you are correct. The total for that is twenty six thousand seven hundred. The refrigerator being eleven thousand seven hundred. The walk-in fruit freezer being fifteen thousand, and then included in that was also the three thousand three hundred and fifty six dollars, which is only the electrical hookups. So the vendor that is providing the units is providing the units only. The electrical is $3,356 to provide those electrical hookups. So what exactly are we committing to tonight? On the board agenda this evening is only the electric and the walk-in cooler. Right. The freezer is the 15.5. And that will come later? That Correct. will come on the 19th. Correct. Thank you. And that work is actually being um, scheduled to be done within the next two weeks. So by then, we'll, we will have a complete unit that will be able to service that building. Other questions? Shouldn't we vote on it before we actually do it? You will. It's not set to, it's not to begin until after the 19th. Correct. Okay. Why are we not just amending the, the agenda and voting on the 15K? We knew it was coming. It's no surprise. That, that is correct. We would have to stop, have public comment because the item is not added. We can do so if you would like. Do we have to have public comment on the deletion of and freezer from the from the agenda? Because that's what we're doing anyway. We're amending the, the item. I'm, I'm hearing we don't have to have anything to remove. Yeah, you don't need to have public comment on anything you're removing, but if we were to add anything to the agenda, then the public would have had to have notice, unless there's some emergency, 
um, or some other you know, heightened reason, um, the public would have to have notice via the agenda on anything additional. But if we're removing it, we're not removing, we would be adding. We, we would have to add the freezer. freezer from this document, from our agenda. We can remove, yes, we can amend the motion to remove the freezer portion, but we couldn't add the 15,000. I apologize. I, I thought you meant that we were adding the 15,000. Just say my frustration at really stupid rules that don't let us just do the business we're supposed to do is, is um, boiling over right now. Do you have the quote? Is, is it the will of the board that we put it on and open for public comment? No. Right. Okay. So, so we are so, we are deleting the freezer from it. So that I'm asking for a motion for so, B and C without the freezer. And you're going to want to do a motion to amend that motion. Okay. Okay. To remove the freezer. All right. So can I have a motion to amend the previous motion to remove the freezer? So moved. Second. Thank you. You're, you're amending the motion that you made uh, for 4A2. It says walk-in cooler and freezer, but the freezer is not included in that 3356. So we are amending the, the motion to just remove the freezer because that's a separate cost to be voted upon at the next board meeting. Sure. So. Just the amendment. Right is everybody now. clear? Okay. We're voting on the amendment. Okay. They have, you have a first and a second, so you're good. Okay. No concerns. I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. And that's the motion to amend. So, so <laughs> now, now we need a motion back to the on the purchase, the actual movement yeah. business of two and three. Which we have in second place, so we just vote. Yes. Okay. Questions or comments about that? It's a, it's a new motion. Okay, this is a new motion. Do I have a motion? For the, thank you. Second. Thank you. So we are voting on A and B with the freezer now removed. Questions or comments? Yeah, I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This this will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Item D. Item D is an administration recommendation to amend the August 22nd, 2022 approval of the Wellspan Medical uh, group service agreement. The only amendment that you're making here is to include Schedule 1 at the back of the contract that you uh, approved on August 22nd. This request came from the Wellspan Medical Group Legal Council, and is, they just wanted to outline the services in detail, what they would be providing um, to the district, and the responsibilities for each party. Do I have a motion? So Second. Thank you. Questions? I think this can be a unanimous roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Okay. The following items are for discussion only. The first item is a recommendation to approve the service agreement with Culinary Digital Inc. Uh, to provide uh, digital signage and integration with Dine Central Menu planning software. So this contract allows us to have a digital menu uh, which is um, available for our sign. So if you go to the food service, you can see that they're in the back behind the cash registers or digital signage. Um, the cost, this is already part of our proposal with food service. It's part of our contract. It's something that we have already had. Um, the vendor um, is requesting that the service agreement be directly with the school district instead of with Whitson's. The amount of the contract is $650 with an implementation fee of $250.
Any questions on that item? Can that come out of the cafeteria fund? Yes. Why can't we get a big one and put it out on the football field and advertise our food? Okay. Item number B. Is it B? Yeah. Two. <laughs> Go back to A. I apologize. My printed copy has the wrong stuff. The affiliation agreement between York, uh, York Suburban School District and York College of Pennsylvania. Dr. Krauser, would you like to speak to this? Um, sure. The, uh, the affiliation agreement uh, represents an opportunity to, to work closely with York College of Pennsylvania to uh, both recruit and retain uh, student teachers as well as incoming teachers. Um, and uh, align a relationship where we have reduced opportunities in pricing for our teachers um, for who are pursuing post-secondary degrees through the college at a discounted rate. Question. Um, this will not prohibit teachers from going to some other colleges of their choice. This is just strictly for those who choose to go to your college, am I correct? C correct. In our yearly budget, uh, I confess I haven't kept track of it, is there a certain amount, total amount, that the faculty has to use for continuing education? There is. Yes. Okay. Can you get me that amount? I'm just out, out of curiosity. four hundred and fifty-eight thousand dollars per okay. contract. So they get everything approved in advance, and when you reach that four hundred fifty thousand, we don't get to go that year. Is that correct? As or get reimbursed for that year? If you. You get approved until the allocation is met. Once the allocation is met, you're on your we own. We don't approve any more. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Do we know how often that happens? Do we know how often that happens? I mean, are there teachers who would opt to go to grad school for coursework that get sorry we're out of money? To my knowledge, and based off of historical expenditures, we have not met that allocation. Now I can go to item C. <laughs> item number C um, is an administration recommendation to, uh, to approve the tuition agreement with New Story. This is a repeated uh, service agreement to provide uh, special education services. The daily rate is $405. Uh, so if this student went for 180 days, uh, it would be 72,900. Item number C is a recommendation to approve the service agreement with Sunbelt to provide telepractice speech and language pathology services. The rate per hour is $87.75. It is not to exceed 20 hours per week. We're requesting this uh, contract to provide uh, uh, teletherapy services. So we currently have three positions with Sunbelt for speech and language pathologists. Uh, one position is vacant and one position is uh, on a leave of absence. So the, this will provide a gap while we uh, seek to fulfill that, that vacancy and then that uh, leave of absence is returned from, from her leave of absence. Item D. Uh, goes along with item H, um, and if you recall, uh, we presented the uh, behavior services grant, um, and one of the recommendations under uh, that grant, the behavior health and school climate grant, was uh, to build capacity for mental health support services. Um, that is through NAMI, uh, National Alliance of Mental Health of York County. So the first item, item D, is to um, approve the actual invoice of the cost of $45,469, um, and it's for the term of 22 to 24. And item H um, provides the uh, memorandum of understanding. So there are two separate items, item agendas. Are there any questions on that? 
is that cost a per year cost or is the for the that's the cost for the full term The next item is a re recommendation for the board to approve the re memorandum of understanding with York Adams Mental Health Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Program to provide case management services. This agreement allows us to refer students um, as the needs are identified. The district is assigned a liaison who works closely with our social worker. This is an existing service um, and there is no cost to the district. The next item is um, requesting board approvals to purchase an electric scissor lift lift in the amount of 11500 to be funded out of the capital projects fund. The next item is a recommendation for the board to approve the 22-23 IDEA non-competitive method sole source agreement uh, as per the uniform grant uh, guidance we are required under federal law to um, procure proprietary if we're prepared procuring proprietary services from the iu we must have a sole source agreement in place and so this is what that does and item h was covered under item d are there any questions on any of the items that I've reviewed? Just a general question. So we approved a number of mental health related items, or, or we, we you talked about. talked about a number of mental health related items. Who, like if, if somebody's listening to this meeting and says, oh wow, we've got more services for mental health. Who's their point of contact here? Is it just the social worker? Is it the guidance counselors? Is it Teachers, I mean, who who is using these services and who is providing the information to the parents? Because that's really who these are for inevitably, right? Yeah, yeah I can comment on that. Um, it, it varies on a couple items. Uh, team approach is really the best way to describe it. Um, so, for example, for NAMI, it, it funnels both through teachers, through guidance departments in conjunction and coordination with the uh, social worker and administration. Um, and each one of those serves as a multiple spread kind of umbrella approach so that there isn't just one person hanging out on that limb for a specific um, point person per se. Um, it really is a team approach for each one of those services. Okay, so. So to add more to that. So for communication that's going out to parents, that's coming from the building um out to the to the to the parents as a whole um students as they're as the communication comes out students can communicate directly to a teacher teachers then know what to do to communicate to the guidance counselor to the services provided it can be um communicated to an administrator who then works with the guidance counselors um so really to create that front line of point service it does involve everyone does that make sense you're you're, you're doing i mean thanks for the overview of the process yeah my question's more driven by how effective does it work? I mean, we're approving, we're gonna to look to approve a number of items here. Mm -hmm. if, if a parent has a child with a mental health issue, how quickly are they gonna utilize these services and how fast are they gonna be able to get into those services? I mean, is, is us approving these at our next meeting, does that help that? Does it make, make the process work better? And, and if you don't have the answer, I, I'd, I'd appreciate an update from either either Dr. Campbell or, or whomever is, is the uh, person to give that, that presentation. Because we have a number of things on here, and, and, and I'm kind of, what's yeah. this doing to help us? Sure. Um, you're describing the exact goal. That, that is the goal, to accelerate those resources and opportunities. Um, but we can certainly provide a more detailed update to that. But... The question you're asking is the goal. The goal is to ensure that we're getting services to students and families at a faster, more appropriate rate. Um, and, and that's the goal by having a broader scope of services that spread across a broader scope of, of professionals to get the services to the families and students that need it. 
Okay. But we'll add to that in greater detail to bring in Dr. Campbell, because I know that she's been, you know, she and Mrs. Campbell, as well as uh, our social worker team, uh, to provide an update with some more specifics on those details. Great. Yep. Great. Thank you. It, along those lines, is it not fair to say if I'm a parent and I have a child who I'm concerned about their mental health, all of the above are going to kick in with services? A, com a teacher I'm comfortable with, I could email, pick up the phone, a building principal, certainly social workers, perhaps your best goal might be to reach out to the guidance counselor. All of those people are, are ready and willing to help meet those needs. Am I right about that? That is correct. It, it, it is a, an army of individuals to, in one sense or another, kind of triage each individual case that comes in and how to best get the services for those particular students or families. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Ms. Long. Okay, so as most of you probably know, homecoming and other homecoming festivities were this past weekend. Um, at the Powderpuff Games, the junior class took the overall win, beating all the classes and the faculty. Um, the bonfire and parade were um, also a success, and the weather co cooperated all weekend, which was a plus. Um, the football team beat York Catholic at the homecoming game 26-0. Um, at all these events, there was a huge turnout of York suburban citizens, and there ended up being 650 students at the dance. And this year's homecoming queen was Kylie Delgado. Um, all the other sports teams like girls and boys soccer, field hockey, girls tennis, golf, and girls volleyball are also doing very well. Their season started recently. Um, this Friday, September 16th, there's a Revs baseball game at 6.30, and that's a fundraiser for Link Crew. Um, on September 24th, from 8 to 2, FCCLA is holding a big yard sale, and a lot of the other clubs are getting involved in that, setting up tables to sell some things that just don't need, aren't needed anymore. Um, Minithon is also hosting Gold Out Week for Childhood Cancer, and this will be a lot of fall sports involved, so that'll be the week of September 26th, and it ends on September 30th with a home football game against Dover. And the last thing is October 15th is Battle of the Buildings, and on October 24th, Minithon is holding a free throw for kids, so that'll also benefit the Four Diamonds Foundation. Okay, thank you. Personnel committee, Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Pose. Now, something tells me I'm going to be starting with a rhetorical question. You have before you the personnel report. Would any board member like any of these items considered separately or are there any questions on any of these items? If not, the chair moves approval of the below mentioned items. I have some comments. Can we have a second first? Okay. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Joel. Um, I would like items A1B and A1D.I considered separately. A1, A1B. A1. Unless mine's numbered wrong. I'm looking at the online. Okay. All right. Yeah. And what's the other one you want separate? A1DI. D. A1DI. All right. Both relate to the. Uh, New position. Um, and the transfer of, of job responsibilities for Dr. Funk. So the motion will be, let me make sure I can transpose, uh, a consent agenda for items A, I1, or 1A. Item C, item D, I, I, and you, you could go the reverse, John, and just, just go with what it doesn't. Okay. Right? So we, we will do the consent agenda 
with everything except item one 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 B. A one A. A one A. And A one D I. A one D I. Both relate to the director of curriculum and instruction. Okay. Do I have a motion? He moved. Okay. But we. Can I have a motion for that? So moved. Do I have a second? Thank you. Any other questions, comments about that? Could you please um, just tell me exactly what we're voting? I know it's a little confusing, but I want to make sure. We are voting on everything except for the recommendation of the position creation of director of curriculum and the vote on the person. That's easier than getting me. Let us pray. Okay. Seems to be a lot of questions. Could we have a roll call vote on this, please? This is on the amended personnel. Mr. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Desai. Yes. Mr. Sanders. Uh, yes, for everything, but yes, to the amended. Us. Yes. Yes. Mrs. Schrader. Yes. Mr. Tillman. Yes. Mr. Sears. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Fry Mrs. Fryrick. Yes. Mr. Posnow. Yes. Motion passes. Now we're looking for a motion that will establish the position of the director of curriculum and appoint a person for the director, director of curriculum. So moved. Second. Thank you. Can we vote on two motions at once? I mean, you essentially okay. did that through the consent agenda, right, by doing all of them. So now the motion on the table is just those two items together. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The one creates the position, the second one staffs it, correct? Correct, correct. Okay. Uh, questions, comments, Joel, do you have any? Yes. Uh, my, my concern is, is both related to the, um, the academics of the district and the budget pressure of the Whopper. We're looking at another structural expense, and this is a Whopper. We have a structural deficit in our, in our budget, which we've had for years. And here we're talking about adding at least $200,000 per year to an administrative position. And I'd say that that's an investment of roughly $2 million over the next 10 years to deal with curricular issues. I think that because of the magnitude and the importance of this decision tonight, the board should be um, recipient of a little bit more information as to the justification, both academic and financial, a better understanding of the responsibilities of this position, the position description, for example, and maybe some discussion of alternatives. It's possible that things like curriculum can be outsourced. We could also create internal task, task forces um, using, for example, Brian Ellis, who's an expert in curriculum and, and actually sells his services as a consultant to other school districts. So, I'm, and then I'll add to that the timing, which is um, problematic in my way of thinking because we have not yet resolved the teacher contract. And until that's settled, I don't think it's a responsible thing to add this much structural expense to the district wherever it resides, but in particular to the administration. And considering that, that we have had significant reductions in teachers and classroom support. This just doesn't seem like the right move at this time for me. Thank you. Mr. President, if I may just clarify, sure. uh, Mr. Sears, uh, this position is not an additional position. Um, item number, well, letter, excuse me, um, A1A is the elimination of a current position to be replaced with a position. So we're not adding another. Yeah, we're not adding another position. So it's not creating a, uh, to your point, an additional um, pay 
pay or, or I forget the number, you, the word you use to describe that position, um, but expense, but it is the replacement and termination of an existing position to be replaced with a different title. I understand that, but it's more than a, more than a title. Unless we're saying that Dr. Ketterman's responsibilities were the same as what we're proposing for Dr. Furman. And the only thing we're doing is cutting the expense slightly and moving a seasoned school principal into another administrative slot and then having to go through that process as well. It is a creation, Scott. We eliminate one and we could stay at that. We could eliminate Dr. Ketterman's position and stay right there. And then we have a conversation about justifying this this position, which is, in fact, a new position. We don't have uh, a director of curriculum at, at present, do we? Correct. We do not. So it is a new position. Yes, I understand what you're saying about slot for slot, but it's a, it's a new position. And I think that it should be, um, let's just be blunt about it. More, more justification is necessary. This is not just a swap. With a, with a nominal reduction in salary. This is a significant position with over the next 10 years, about a $2 million investment. And I'm not sure what we get for that. I'd like to have a better idea what we get for that and whether there are alternatives. That's a lot of money. Well, I, I guess I, I would make the observation that we've been talking for over a year and a half about the declining performance of, of grades kind of across the classes, middle school and other. And one of the justifications was that we needed a unified curriculum that was managed and planned by one person. So this is not brand new. This has been talked about for a year. Understand that, John, but there are alternatives. We don't need to make a long-term commitment to solve a short-term problem. At least we should have, have some alternatives put in front of the board. This is a big expense. And listening to Mr. Evans earlier and considering other input from the community, it just seems to me that we don't have enough information to authorize this position and staff it at this point. That is not to say that, that curriculum and academics are not important. Of course they are. Or the curriculum and instruction is not important. Of course they are. So uh, I, I echo Mr. Sears' comments. Um, but, I, but my, I'm coming at it more from a questioning standpoint. So stick with me here. And, and if, you, if we need to get back to this at a later date, that's fine. So how many districts of our size have this position currently in place? How many districts in your county currently have this position in place? What are the tangible, measurable benefits of having this position? Why are you recommending this, Dr. Krauser, for your team? How did we handle this as a district before we had this position, and why are you changing it? Those are just the start of my questions, and I'm sure as as we delve into the answers, I'm going to come up with more. But um, you know, these are some of the critical factors that I'd be wanting to understand more of uh, before making a vote on this. I, I don't have all those exact numbers at, at the present time. I do know those positions do exist throughout the county. Um, distinctly, the goal has been, since we've been analyzing our, our current needs, our curriculum uh, exposure, these particular positions have been shared across multiple divisions. Um, by doing that, we have seen them to be less effective. Um, the idea here is that we're focusing a direct, we've heard from the will of the board, a direct and focused attention on student achievement to do that, we have to ensure to guarantee viable curriculum that's, you know, occurring K to 12, uh, seamless and comprehensive from start to finish. Um, that's where the recommendation came from in this particular position and how it unfolds. The position that has been eliminated already by the vote, um, Dr. Ketterman's position, was a shared position, meaning Dr. Ketterman shared elementary curriculum. Uh, the former, my former position was secondary curriculum. At the same time, she also did administration federal programmings, um, and some shared opportunities. The goal with this position and this recommendation is to peel out the other positions that Dr. Ketterman had, put them on top of Dr. Lorfink's current position strategy, um, position responsibilities, and have this focus on 
what Dr. Lorfink had in secondary curriculum instruction and assessment, what Dr. Ketterman had in, in elementary curriculum instruction and assessment, and have that be one individual piece of that puzzle. Um, so there was direct focus on it. Regards to the specifics on how many exact uh, districts have that, I, I have to do a little legwork to find that out. And, and my question is more of uh, those districts that currently have it in place, how are they measured? How successful are they? And, and please, I, I think the person that you're, you're nominating for this position is, is, is excellent yeah. for it. So, so my vote tonight, because we don't have the, or you don't have the answers right now. I'm sure you'll get them, but my vote will be no tonight because I don't have the information. It's not because I'm not supportive of the person. It's the, it's, it's kind of like what Mr. Evans said. I, it's, it's, it's more of a, I don't understand how we're going to measure success going forward with this position because to your point, our, our, our results haven't been what historically York Suburban has been used to. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree with you, the curriculum possibly is, a, is an answer. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but until I understand who else is using this, how successful they are, and, and more importantly, how we're going to measure it, and what our off-ramp is if it's not working, I, I just can't support this tonight. Sure. Um, and I, I can say from a development standpoint, um, in the, in the work that I did, I'd look beyond York County. Um, in a comparative sense, I believe we do need to extend beyond York County. We want our, 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 our graduates to go beyond York County. We want them to certainly provide back to our, our local community, but go beyond. Um, so I, as often and, and as we've often referenced in, in presentations from a building level and administrative level, we, we seek to the highest performing districts in the state. Um, and again, I know every district has a different setup, but I will compare it locally. But we did design that from both the job responsibilities and how that's utilized through the work beyond the county. But I can get some specific. Well, my first it. my my first question was similar size districts. Yeah, I don't absolutely. care about York County. Yep. I mean, but I just said how many other York County since sometimes we we yep. makes sense. We compare to them, and sometimes we don't. It just depends on the situation. Yeah. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Other comments. Dr. Krauser, do I understand correctly that when you developed this position, you were looking at basically streamlining and, and improving the organization of curriculum development? That is correct. To be the most efficient possible for the district going forward. And may I add effective. The goal was efficient, but, but effective as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I thought I understood that previously, but you've confirmed it. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Dr. Krauser, uh, you seem to be making the point earlier that um, when this was a shared position, one of the other sort of hypothetical ways of doing this, which was suggested, um, was something like a committee of department chairs. Um, uh, I take it from your comments that you that your professional opinion is that that would lack either the continuity or accountability to be effective. It's a group of people. Correct. And and the other part of that, um, some of the responsibilities that are required from a director of curriculum instruction or or other central opposition uh, can't be housed by a teacher certified position. Some of the reporting that's be done to state um, and some of that communication outward beyond that. Uh, the other piece of that is and I meant by the focus component is um, and I'll use the my prior experience as the assistant superintendent um, sharing responsibilities in certain areas like. I'll say safety when you're split up among those two areas at given times of the year, one may require a greater focus. The goal here is to ensure that curriculum instruction maintains a single laser focus through the entirety of, of, the, of the comprehensive plan process and then the execution of our goals. So that would be the goal. To use that as teacher landscape that would be only a certain number of days per year without summer planning and or per diem paying or hourly rates that we're paying wouldn't accomplish that same task. Um, and what what performance metrics for this position would you expect to have? Sure. Um, so similarly to other administrative positions, they're required through the state of Pennsylvania to produce student performance measures. So there's an evaluative tool we use in the Act 13 that Dr. Lord Frank had measured, which measures their performance as it links to the measurement of student performance. So that's one area, uh, as well as the alignment to goals that would would link clearly back to their evaluation. Um, Dr. Krauser, is it 
your opinion that this position is critical in nature to you carrying out your mission as a superintendent to make our, our district successful? I absolutely believe so. Thank you. And it's not, this isn't news to us. We, we've heard this from you, I believe, from the onset. Um, I, it, it's no surprise to people who know me. I, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for teachers. I don't like the fact that our numbers are uh, over the recommended guidelines. I don't like the fact that we have, have uh, eliminated physical education uh, positions or high school social studies. But my concern is that we are conflating the two. I, I think we need to have a separate discussion about where we are with the counts and where we are with staffing and bite the bullet and add some staff. That's some teachers. That's that's my concern. I know enough about education, and I think many of us sitting around this table know enough about education to know that you have to have this continuity of curriculum. And it's it's a position that I believe we've been lacking. Um, and I, and I will support this tonight, um, but I, I would like us to circle back and see where we are. We, we're we not doing the best we can for our students if we aren't teaching AP U.S. history. That was a surprise to me tonight. I had, did not know we had uh, eliminated that. Uh, just as an example, that's, that's big. Um, and I don't like the fact that the numbers are so high at Indian Rock. Maybe we need to contemplate moving the line and, and leveling those out. I don't know what the answers are. But my concern here for the purposes of this discussion is that we are conflating the two topics. And, and that's another topic that I'd like us to have very soon. But for this topic tonight regarding the uh, Director of Curriculum and Instruction, uh, I, I think it's important and can support it tonight. Other comments? What's the net between the two positions, the net increase in salary or difference? It's a, it's a decrease. Decrease? Mm -hmm. okay. Could we have a roll call vote, please? All right, we're voting on the creation of the position and the filling of the position for the curriculum. Mr. Desai? Yes. Mr. Sanders? No. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tillman? Yes. Mr. Posnow? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Mrs. Schrader? Yes. Mr. Sears? No. Mrs. Fryrick? Yes. Motion passes. I believe that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Sears, Property and Finance. Thank you, Mr. Posnell. Property and Finance <clears throat> Committee met on August 15th, 5 p.m. in the boardroom. We approved the minutes of the May 2nd meeting. I think the, the link in the online um, Board agenda tonight has an error. The administrative report uh, was given by Jessica Thompson covering facilities. She brought us up to date on the summer work, talked about the district gas pump, which does not currently function or did not at that time, talked about some alternatives. One was to repair, uh, the other was to close, use gas cards, etc., and the other was to replace with an above ground system. So we're still considering what to do with that uh, district gas pump. She also brought us up to date on the high school pool situation with the UV light disinfectant system, which was installed in July of 2010. And we were looking at replacing, repairing, and so on, as opposed to a new system. If I took my notes correctly, the repair cost was 16.3,000, and the new system is 17,600. So that was the information we got. We also talked about the Indian Rock walk in freezer and cooler. And we're given uh, the same information we got tonight, and that the total cost would not exceed 26000 and that would come from the um, food service fund. There was no public comment. Meeting was adjourned at 5.30. Next meeting, November 7th, 5 p.m. in the board. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you.
legislative update. Thank you, Mr. Pose. Now, I must begin with news that ordinarily would strike fear in the hearts of the most stalwart among us. The General Assembly is back in session. But the good news is that owing to the timing, there the Senate will only be in session for about 10 days, and the House will only be in session for about 12 days. So there's probably very little damage they can do in that time. Moving forward, though, we can expect to look for uh, legislation dealing with amendments in the right to know law. Uh, another big push probably for financial literacy education. This seems to be an issue that's gathering strength in both houses that will teach our students fiscal literacy, such as balancing checkbooks and using credit cards, and probably educating a whole new generation of students to serve equitably and much better than the current legislature in fiscal matters. Uh, third will be changes to the Sunshine Law pertaining to broadcast meetings and public comments. And of course, the court case on equitable funding for Pennsylvania schools drags on, but to date there is no truth to the rumor that they're going for the Guinness World Book of Records. If there are no questions, that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Ms. Fryer. Still didn't change the agenda. No, Mr. we didn't. We didn't change okay. the order. Um, you have before you the highlights uh, from the LIU meeting of September 6th. Always interesting to see uh, what is going, out, going on out there. Uh, I have no report from the Joint Operating Authority. We have not yet met this fall. But I have good news from York Adams Academy. Uh, we have started out and with just all, on all cylinders. Uh, we have 102 of 160 seats filled. We have six graduates already for this coming year. In fact, I have to sign a diploma tomorrow because we have a young lady who's uh, waiting to be inducted into the military, which is very exciting for her. Uh, in particular, York Suburban has filled 15 of our 15 seats, which is always good. Um, and usually we need to purchase a few more as the year goes by. Uh, you also have the highlights from the August 30th meeting of the uh, Academy Board. If there are no questions, that concludes my report. Thank you. York County Staff Review. No report. Thank you. York County School. Yes, thank you. The new school year at the York County School of Technology is off to a great start. The administrative team and faculty uh, organized at the beginning of the year a very successful introduction and orientation program for incoming freshmen and new students. Uh, just as an aside, you'll remember that. Um, they are tasked with bringing together students from some 14 districts across the county who have no history together at all. So it's quite a challenge to bring them together in some kind of unified fashion. They call it the Spartan Jam. They uh, it was a, a very successful program and a big hit with the students. And so they're off to a great start. I do have a few numbers to share. The ninth grade class is full for the year. Total school enrollment is 1,656. York Suburban has a total of 68 students enrolled this year, which I believe is a slight increase over last year. In addition to that number, we have six juniors and or seniors who are enrolled in the part-time flex program and five seniors who are enrolled in the full-time flex program. That simply means that they take core subjects at York Suburban, and I believe it's in the afternoon, they go over to tech and participate in their shop program. Um, they are trying to promote that, and, and it seems that it's, it's a big hit at York Suburban. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that the Adult and Continuing Education Program gave a report at our August meeting and shared that they had trained uh, last school year in their various full-time and part-time programs, some 2,700 students in their various adult education and continuing education programs. It is a self-funded program, as you probably know, and in my view is a, a genuine asset to our community. Programs like nursing, welding, commercial trucking, plumbing, mechatronics, um, they continue to uh, 
trained some 2,700 students in uh, last school year. So just wanted to update you just a tad on what's happening at the School of Technology. Unless there are questions, that would conclude my report. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to take this time to thank everybody who sat in. <laughs> and uh, we have a link here to the board meeting and committee meeting schedules. And this is the last opportunity for public comment. If there's no public comment, I just have uh, one thing I want to bring up. Okay. So yesterday was the anniversary of 9 11. It's been 21 years since the, uh, uh, the tragic events of that day. And the one thing that it, it marked for me was the togetherness that it brought this country, you know, brought forth in this country. And I guess where I'm, I'm a bit shocked is when I talk to parents, I talk to kids, I talk to my own children. We, we went through the 20th anniversary, 19th, 18th, you know, the years I've been on board. I asked the same question around this time of year. Did you guys talk about 9-11 today? I have yet to hear one child or one parent tell me that they talked about it. As a person that was downtown Manhattan that day and watched the second plane go in, I will tell you that it was one of the most tragic but uplifting post 9-11 events that I've ever been through. It was a national tragedy that brought us together. I have not brought this up in a board meeting every year. I've sent emails to Dr. Williams, and he never responded in terms of having some type of school district-wide moment of silence or some type of, hey, history teachers, make sure this is on the curriculum every year. It's an event that is fresh in everybody's minds, but unfortunately is being forgotten on our younger generation. And as Mr. Robinson brought up, if we're going to train these next generations of leaders, that's an event and what we did post 9-11 that you can point to. Albeit temporarily, we had a feeling of togetherness and pride in how we were able to go and handle those that did that to us. So I implore you, Dr. Krauser, to send that message out to the staff to the leaders of this community, because I think it's important that we never forget what happened that day. That's that's all I got. Thanks. I, I will comment. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I actually did communicate to my administrative team on Sunday for that very reason. Um, it is a very personal connection to me as well. Um, at that time, knowing individuals that were in, you know, and lost in the building at that time. So I would agree. Uh, and I did reach out to my team yesterday for that very reason. So thank you for bringing that up. And if there are no other things, I think we're adjourned. Thank you.